Welcome back to the Security Simplified series. Last time, we talked about some of the most common ways applications implement single sign-on and how attackers can use subdomain takeovers to bypass SSO protection based on shared session cookies. This time, let's talk about some common misconfigurations of SAML authentication and how they can be exploited by attackers to bypass access control in a single sign-on system. Single sign-on is a feature that allows users to access multiple services without logging in multiple times. For example, if you were logged into Facebook, you wouldn't have to re-enter your credentials to use Messenger. The implementation of SSO is easy if the multiple services are located under the same parent domain, like these two versions of Facebook. These two services have the same parent domain, facebook.com, so SSO can be achieved by sharing cookies across subdomains. By specifying a cookies domain like this, the browser would automatically share the cookie with all subdomains of the parent domain. But browser cookies cannot be shared across different domains, so Facebook and Messenger cannot share cookies because they don't share a common parent domain. And this is where SAML comes into play. SAML, or the Security Assertion Markup Language, can be used to implement SSO when the services don't share a parent domain. It is an XML-based markup language used as a mechanism for exchanging authentication data between an identity provider and a service provider. SAML enables SSO by facilitating the interaction between three parties, the user, the identity provider, and the service provider. The user is you, who has the right to access your information on a website. The identity provider refers to the server that is in charge of authenticating the user. It will ask the user for a proof of identity, and once the user has logged in, pass the user's information to all the services that the user is trying to access. Whereas the service provider refers to the actual site that the user intends to access which in this example is Facebook and Messenger. When the user is trying to access a service, the service redirects the user to the identity provider. The identity provider authenticates the user and sends back a SAML response that can be used to prove the user's identity at the service provider. Finally, the user can send the SAML response to the service provider to access its services. This system allows companies with multiple web services to only manage a centralized source of user credentials instead of keeping track of users for each site. It also eliminates the need for users to log in multiple times when using the services provided by the same company. And as you can see from the diagram, the SAML response is how the service provider determines who's the, who the user is. If the attacker can control and manipulate the SAML response passed to the service provider, they can trick the service provider and authenticate as someone else. Let's take a look at how this works. Since the SAML response is used to relay authentication information to the service provider, it usually contains some fields that communicate that data. For example, you can look for field names like username, email address, and user ID. If the attacker can tamper with these fields, they can change the outcome of the authentication. SAML usually uses a signature to ensure the integrity of the SAML response so that attackers cannot tamper with it. Digital signatures are a way to ensure data integrity. It usually involves adding a one-way hash of the message using a secret key. And at the receiving side of the message, the contents of the message are hashed again using the same key. Since the attacker does not have the secret key, they cannot calculate the correct hash, so cannot, they cannot falsify the contents of the message. But signature-based security is not always well implemented. Sometimes the SAML response lacks a signature or the signature is not verified at all. This way, all the attacker needs to do is to tamper with the fields directly. And sometimes the developers make the mistakes of only verifying the signature when it exists. In this case, the attacker can manually remove the signature value from the SAML response. For example, they can empty out the signature field or remove the field entirely. And when SAML signature used by the application is predictable, 
the attacker can simply recalculate the signature and force a valid SAML response. So first, an attacker can locate the SAML response by intercepting the request going between their browser and the service provider. After tampering with the SAML response with one of these three methods, they can simply re-encode the message into its original form and send it back to the service provider. The service provider will use that information to authenticate the attacker to the service. And in this case, the attacker can obtain a valid session with another user's account. Improper implementation of SAML signatures will completely invalidate the integrity of a SAML-based SSO system. To prevent this issue, you can implement a strong signing and signature validation process for your SAML messages. And that's it for today's security lesson. Next time, let's talk about security issues that affect other SSO mechanisms.